Um, we'd like to hold questions uh, for the most part until uh, we, we get through the deck. Um, but if there's things that we say or throw out or terminology that you don't understand, uh, please stop us in the middle of the program and uh, you know ask a question if uh, if we say something that uh, that doesn't make sense. We tend to throw out uh, things like LOI and and uh, I was actually here last night and uh, and after talking to somebody for about five minutes, they said, "What what's an LOI?" Uh, which is something I sort of take for granted. So uh, letter of intent, if anybody's wondering. Uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is the, uh, the key ingredients for, for raising capital for early stage companies um, and, and how a deal comes together. Uh, lots of great ideas on this campus and um, lots of burgeoning entrepreneurs, but, but uh, the hardest part is, uh, is getting, getting the capital. Uh, just to give you a little bit on my background. Um, I'm a, uh, a partner at uh, Shepherd Mullen in the corporate practice group. I'm fortunate enough to be a uh, resident here in our Santa Barbara office. I also lead the, uh, the firm's M&A uh, team, which is mergers and acquisitions. I do uh, M&A, corporate finance, uh, work with a lot of technology and emerging growth companies. Uh, listed on the screen is a couple of the deals I've been involved in the last year or two. And uh, most of you have this, this handout. I've done. Uh, uh, about four billion dollars in transactions in the last 24 months uh, for public company uh, merger transactions and a couple of uh, IPOs, including for a, a company that uh, that Rusty used to work for. Uh, and just to tell you a little bit about Shepard Mullen, uh, we were founded in LA in 1927, uh, so we're a little older than uh, Great Pacific Capital. Rusty will tell you about its origins. Um, we're a full-service business law firm. We're one of the 100 largest firms in the United States. We've got about 500 lawyers, uh, mostly in California. Uh, and then we also have offices in New York, Washington, and we just recently opened in Shanghai, uh, which is a, which up until, I guess it was Monday, was a pretty hot market. Um, <laughs> cooled off a little bit this week. Um, our clients include uh, about half of the Fortune 100. Uh, but we do a lot of work with what we call middle market companies, 25 to 500 million in enterprise value. And I work a lot, as do many of my partners, with companies that have no revenue. And we work trying to help them uh, build up their revenue, build up their profitability so they can afford our fees. Um, anyway, that's a little bit about us, and I'll let Rusty talk about, uh, about his background. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the university for having us. Um, certainly appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Um, Tom is the one that actually uh, recruited me into this. And, uh, a little and aren't you happy about I, that? I am happy about that. Um, I know Tom uh, as he was the counsel for FastClick, which is a local Santa Barbara internet advertising company that we took public in 2005. Um, I was trying to figure out just how well I knew Tom, and I figured I'm kind of a numbers analysis finance guy, so I figured I'd take a look at the billings, <laughs> and I figured out that I know you 4,000 hours well. <laughs> so uh, my background, a little bit about my background, um, I am out of the investment banking business. Uh, when, I went out of, when I left Vanderbilt University, I moved to Texas and worked for a boutique investment bank doing um, middle market M&A, regionally focused in the Southwest. Um, we also did some private debt and public debt and actually some public equity deals. So from a, uh, from a timing perspective, we were focused on technology as it was the late 90s and everybody was focused on technology. Uh, from a product perspective, uh, we serviced the gamut from debt to equity, private and public. <clears throat> um, I moved out to uh, California to take a job with ValueClick, who at the time was in Carpinteria. Uh, they were a pre-IPO company and um, were in need of uh, an analyst. Um, I shepherded the management team through their initial public offering in early 2000. I um, went from ValueClick to HomeStore. Um, at the time I joined HomeStore, they had a $5 billion market cap, over $400 million in cash, and in the ensuing two years, my team executed $180 million in acquisitions for them. 
Um, I was recruited by FastClick in 2003 and was brought on to, uh, to do their Series A recap um, as well as uh, take the company public and ultimately my charge was selling the company to ValueClick. Um, I then worked for ValueClick in corporate development and locally for a company you guys may know, Commission Junction as uh, in kind of a CFO, localized CFO capacity. I am now, um, we have not been around since 1927. Uh, Great Pacific Capital is roughly five months old. Uh, my partner is the founder of FastClick and I have started a local venture capital firm. Um, we are geographically focused north of Westlake Village, south of San Luis Obispo, most specifically, our work's going to take place primarily in the Santa Barbara and Goleta area. Um, is Dave an alum? Dave is a UCSB engineering alum. Um, Dave Gross, his partner, was one of the founders of, of FASCO. Yes. So. Um, he didn't our, want to come back uh, here for some reason. We. <laughs> yeah. So I got stuck with it. So um, uh, our, our, our value add in venture investing is that we have localized startup to exit experience. We started, FastClick Fast Click was started in 2000 and between 2000 and 2005, uh, you know, we, we feel like we faced, you know, all the trials and tribulations of growing um, a business from a $400,000 seed round of capital into a $225 million public company acquisition. Um, and we feel it's that it's that experience that we like to lend to the companies that we're investing in uh, in order for them to better navigate um, the, uh, the trials and tribulations of growing a business in the Central Coast. Uh, our investment model, we are primarily investing in applied technology companies. What does that mean? We are looking for, we are looking for companies that have found a way to fill an unmet need in a market by applying technology to solve a problem. Um, implicit in our investment model is companies that have a strong management team um, and as I said our, uh, our kind of our value add, our, 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 our so what as they say is that we have a very high touch model um, as we have the, uh, the been there attitude and high touch for uh, assisting the companies that um, we've invested in. An overview of what we're going to go through today. Um, we're going to race through the beginning, which is types of capital, as I'm imagining um, most of you have some familiarity with what type of capital is out there, um, sources of capital, what venture capitalists look for, and how to find capital is where I think we're going to spend um, the majority of our time. And then lastly, we're going to close with how a transaction actually comes together. So uh, as I alluded to at, at the beginning, uh, anybody who's tried to raise capital for an early stage company knows that it is extremely difficult and time consuming, even in uh, bull markets and the go-go times, uh, you know, such as 1997 to 2000, when a lot of you look like you were probably uh, still in junior high. Um, it, it's not an easy job. Uh, people don't just readily whip out their checkbook and, and, uh, yeah. and go. The takeaway here is people and their checkbooks generally don't divert. Let me get that off of there. Let's go. Um, so there's two main types of capital. There's debt, which everybody, I know I'm heavily in debt, so <laughs> probably a lot of people in this room borrow money. Uh, you have to pay it back usually or you can declare bankruptcy. Uh, it's really tough for an early stage company to borrow money. Uh, early stage companies usually don't have a lot of assets um, and uh, you know they have little or no cash uh, cash flow to borrow against uh, so what they typically default to is equity investment and that is an investment in the future profits of the business and it gets repaid through a liquidity event such as a sale uh, or what we call a recapitalization which is a, a partial sale of the equity of the business or through dividends which is distributions of, of profits uh, where do you find money? Um, there, there's, uh, there's bootstrapping or self-funding, and we'll go through each of these. Friends and family, government uh, grants and programs, uh, what we call angel investors, 
Uh, there's a commercial banker who just walked into the back of the room, so you can get his business card before the, uh, before the, uh, the, the night is out. Uh, strategic investors and, uh, and, and venture capitalists. So we'll talk a little bit uh, about each one of these. So bootstrapping is probably the most common way for an early stage company, particularly a first time entrepreneur, to get their business going. I just read a study uh, preparing for this that something like 80% of the Inc. 500, which are the 500 fastest growing companies in the US, started uh, by raising their first million dollars uh, or, or so uh, through bootstrapping and, and self-funding. Um, what is it? It's pinching pennies. It, it's selling your product or service as quickly as you can, as cheaply as you can to bring money into the business. Some entrepreneurs, uh, even those that have been successful, uh, think it's an advantage because it really crystallizes your, your focus on making money and, and not spending money because ultimately that's what building a business is about. Um, so again, it's, it's a real asset test uh, for, for the business because if you can't generate cash from selling your product or your service, it's game over. It, it, you know, you're, you're done. So it, it, it really does uh, you know, focus the entrepreneur in on, on what they need to do to, to get something to market as quickly as possible. I think at the same time, ultimately, a company having succeeded, um, starting out from a beginnings of bootstrapping, tends to have the most credibility uh, as it is the most difficult way to start a business. And to the extent you actually are able to uh, get off the ground after a, a bootstrapped beginning, um, it's, it provides an enormous amount of credibility in your later stage capital raising. A good example of this is FastClick. Bootstrapping can be, boot, bootstrapping isn't necessarily, so friends and family is next. Oftentimes you can have a, fin, a friends and family around and still be considered a bootstrapped company. It's, they're not, mutually exclusive right. necessarily. So uh, FastClick is a good example of a local company that raised, uh, for the time that it raised, it raised a $400,000 round of capital in the year 2000. If you guys remember in the year 2000, um, bootstrapping was not the word of the day. Companies were raising very large, very early rounds of capital and spending it on Super Bowl ads. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think, as Rossi said, one of the things that makes later investors feel good about a company that, it, that has bootstrapped its way to some scale and credibility is that they feel that they're pretty conservative, that they really are creative about uh, cost control and those types of things, which, which really uh, gets investors uh, comfortable. It literally purchases later stage credibility. Uh, so. You run out of money, you've, you've maxed out your credit cards, you've done everything you can, you've gotten as creative as possible, so you know, wh where do you go next? Uh, for, for most people, it, it, again, it's not to the venture capitalists, it's, it's they start hitting up their, their friends and their wealthy uncle and, and their family. Um, you know, a very common, and, and uh, we, we have some sort of negative connotations about that, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's a very viable way to, again, try and build some scale and, and, and build, uh, build your business a little bit. Can be tricky, a lot of emotions, um, blood and money don't mix too well. Um, it's tough enough when you have a business fail, but it's even worse when you lose your friends' uh, money. They, they usually aren't your friends at that point. Um, most friends and family aren't going to add a lot of value to the business, so really all you're getting is, is cash and a lot of questions and nervous people saying, when am I going to get my money back? When am I going to get my money, money back? Um, but, it, but it can be, you know, I, I don't know if good option, but it's, it's, it's usually one of the only viable options for, for most uh, emerging and very small businesses. And, uh, right. And sometimes <laughs> it works out well. Right, and when it works out well, you made the right. Dave Gross has a lot more friends now than he did uh, five years ago. <laughs> um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on government programs because, frankly, I don't know what the heck I'm talking about when it comes to these things. But uh, th there is Small Business Administration loans, uh, National Science Foundation grants, uh, military grants. They're, they're, you know, I'm sure uh, some of the folks here on campus have a, have a number of avenues for people to go to get uh, uh, research grants and, and some, some help to, uh, to supplement uh, what little capital they have. So it's another area to, to look at uh, carefully as you, uh, as you try and build your business. Um, angels. 
uh, you know, these are usually wealthy or, or more wealthy uh, than the rest of us individuals um, that will invest in early stage companies before uh, traditional venture capital, uh, sometimes as little as, as $25,000. Um, they, they tend to have some uh, business savvy, but, but not always. Uh, part of what they're after uh, is the experience of, of mentoring and being involved in building a business. Uh, often people that have you know, a successful business track record uh, and maybe semi-retired uh, are, are looking to do angel investing because they, they really do want to they help and, and, and be involved and not just go to the golf course and hang out at the beach. Um, I, I hope there's not any doctors or dentists or, or lawyers, um, and I, I'm not a courtroom lawyer, so I added that uh, to, to that bullet point. Uh, some of my litigation partners would probably not be happy with this bullet point, but um, beware of people, of, you know, there's a lot of wealthy professionals out there, and I hope I haven't offended any doctors or dentists in the, uh, in the audience. Um, but you know, be aware, there's a lot of people that, that are very smart uh, in their profession. Um, they tend to be in my experience, pretty tough investors to, to have, and, and particularly courtroom lawyers. Um, really stay away from them. Um, there's lots of angels out there. Um, I, th I think at last count, there's something like two million angel investors in, in the US. Um, they're difficult to find, though. There's not really a, a book out there. There's lots of organizations um, like Tech Coast Angels and others uh, that where these folks do organize themselves. But it's not like there's a an internet site where you can get all these people. There used and to be that, uh, there was that one, what was that site where you got to heaven or whatever? Yeah. There, there was, there was a, a, a site, but it went belly up in 2001, where all these angels would come and look at business plans on the internet. Generally, they're, they're not branding themselves, so they're less difficult to locate. More difficult to locate. I'm sorry. Um, uh, and then the last point is, you know, the angels will provide some capital, but typically they're not really going to provide the kind of validation for your business that a strategic or, or uh, institutional investor would. I think that angels, when it comes down to angel investors, uh, you know, there's kind of two categories, and what's going to fit best with you as an entrepreneur is by finding somebody who has the same chemistry. If you were looking for a hands-on angel who is willing to step in and be a good advisor and be available and be a good help, that's the right situation for you to the extent you're looking to get a chunk of capital and run as fast as you can in one direction and hope he never calls you don't want to have the overbearing angel and vice versa to the extent you um, to the extent angels want somebody who's going to be available for them to coach to the extent this is a second job for an angel that chemistry has to be there Um, we're going to move on to more professional, I should say, sources of capital. We've been through uh, the bootstrapping. Amateurs. Yeah, we've been through the amateurs, which is bootstrapping, friends and family, um, and, and then you know, kind of the, the step above there being angels. Um, the next step uh, would fall into commercial banks and other lenders. Um, generally, for early stage companies, um, commercial banks are debt or are going to offer some sort of a debt product. Debt's going to need to be secured. A company's going to have to have assets. It's, it's not always a great fit um, outside of things like equipment leasing and financing um, to the extent a, uh, a startup is going to have um, heavy capital equipment expense and some sort of capital equipment that has liquidity on the open market. Um, banks will definitely come in and finance equipment financing for you. Um, when they do come in, generally they're looking to secure their loan with either A, your assets, or B, your cash flow. Uh, next uh, in the list is strategic investors. Um, strategic investors are not always concerned with the same level of return that uh, a venture investor on, on the far end of the spectrum is going to be concerned with. And oftentimes, strategic investors have ulterior motives, um, generally those motives falling uh, on the side of leveraging your technology to benefit their product suite, um, A, or B, selling your technology across their company. Um, they are 
And just so we're clear, what we're talking about is the, the venture investment arm of an operating company. Most large technology companies, publicly traded technology companies, have some sort of investment arm that is looking for investments in uh, the same industry or extensions of the industry that their core business is in. So just that, that's what we mean by strategic investors. So it would be uh, Sony investing in you know, a video game company or uh, you know, Cisco investing in a, in a company that does routers, those kinds of things. Cisco is famous for this. They use their venture arm as... Um, it's their, part of their R&D. It's part, uh, yeah, it's part of R&D. Um, strategic investors are very valuable as far as validation going forward and credibility for your business model. Um, pretty tricky situations to navigate due to confidentiality. Oftentimes it's possible to detract from the value of your business by essentially showing one of the larger competitors what's under your hood. Um, just one other point. The, the other, one of the benefits of a strategic aside from, uh, it's, it's also uh, can be a little scary. Uh, they are a likely acquirer of many businesses that they invest in. So uh, one of the, the tricks when you get in bed with a strategic investor is they're going to be watching and trying to, if they think there's something of value there, uh, pick it up in a less competitive process or before the business might get to full maturity. And so one of the tricks is you're gonna, you, you might get in bed with, uh, with somebody like this and they'll start to offer you 10 million or 20 million or 30 million for a business that in 18 months may be worth 500 million because of the explosive growth prospects that it has. As I said, it's, they're often difficult situations, situations to navigate and um, definitely require someone like Tom at your side <laughs> to, uh, to work through. Sometimes hard to say no to the, to the money. Um, lastly, we're going to talk about uh, venture investors. Venture investors are, uh, have traditionally been investors investing in very early stage companies and assisting these companies in their growth cycle between, uh, let's say, infancy and adolescence. Um, I think that recently in the venture industry, a lot of the uh, traditional firms out of Boston and um, San Francisco have extended the definition of venture investing as they've raised larger and larger funds, um, more and more capital in, this, uh, in the venture business is being deployed in later stage businesses. I'm talking about businesses that have 50 plus million in revenue and significant earnings already under the... Um, this is a function of Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but is the um, laws that have been passed in the wake of um, some of the companies like WorldCom and Enron um, that are uh, corporate practices laws, and those laws have forced the, uh, the companies that have been trying to go public to defer going public until later in their uh, growth cycle because it is that expensive to be public. Um, this has created a longer pre-IPO growth cycle and has allowed venture investors to raise more money and deploy capital later in that cycle, incurring less risk in the growth of the company and still get the same venture type returns. Um, while that has been the trend, it has opened up a little bit of a hole at the bottom of the market where people still are seeding um, early stage companies. And uh, that's kind of where Great Pacific would fit in. Um, local, regional, uh, focused on very early stage companies with a high touch approach. Um, venture capitalists, as I said, generally are entrepreneurs who uh, have done well and have good experience in growing companies, um, often looking to leverage that experience across a portfolio of investments. Um, why would you take capital from a venture investor? Oftentimes they're well connected um, from service providers who are locally to uh, access to management talent, to investment banking expertise, and um, the ability to negotiate subsequent rounds of capital on behalf of the company. It kind of is, it's, it's, it's like bringing in uh, a professional services team for free. 
Um, and lastly, it validates the business. Venture investors are generally the most due diligent of investors, and uh, that puts a pretty big stamp of approval on the business model associated with the company that's raising the capital. Um, uh, I think that's pretty much all I'm going to say. What are venture capitalists looking for? Venture investors are looking for early stage, high technology products that are generally going to be disruptive within a market. Um, good examples of this, uh, a great example of this is Jamdat. Yeah, I'll, Jamdat. I'll give you this. So, so really what they're looking for is an opportunity in a large, not just a large market, but a, a large and growing market. Um, about five or six years ago, I got involved with this company that uh, at the time it seemed like kind of a silly idea, but they were the, the first uh, real pioneer in making, putting video games on the cell phone platform. And at the time, what was so attractive to the venture capital community, and this company ultimately raised about 40 million of venture capital before we took them public, was how ubiquitous, there were, there were sort of two trends in the cell phone industry. Uh, cell phones were exploding. Everybody had a cell phone, not just in the United States, but overseas, Asia, Europe, South America. It's the most ubiquitous consumer device on the planet now. And they saw that trend, you know, billions of handsets out in the marketplace. At the same time, the phones were becoming more feature friendly. Color screens, easier to use. You know, this was before there were cameras and video and, and all the, the widgets. And so those two trends uh, created the opportunity for, for a pretty high revenue business. And in, uh, you know, one, once those trends took place, this company went from about $9 million in revenue in 2004, did over $120 million in 2005. Um, last year, earlier, in, uh, about a year ago, in 2006, uh, they were acquired by Electronic Arts for, uh, for about $700 million. Uh, so th this is a company that in 2001, a business that didn't exist, and because of market trends, and the fact that they were filling this need that people you know, wanted to do things with their phones, uh, were able to create a very viable business in a, in a short period of time. Needless to say, the, the venture capitalists that put the, uh, the $38 million in at various points uh, all did, did very well, probably got a return of about uh, $400 million on their $38 million investment, which is right on target with what they, what they look for. Yeah. Uh, I want to elaborate a little bit on the definition of large and growing. Um, we had a, uh, an inventor come in and talk to us the other day, and he had, not to give away the product, he has a very neat widget. And I said, that's really an amazing product. I wouldn't buy it, but it's really an amazing product. How many of them do you think we could sell if we could get everybody who has an interest in a product like this in the United States to buy it. And the answer was $10 million. That is not a large market. One of the things that um, has to be considered as you're moving forward with your business plan is defining your market. Where do you compete? How big is that market? And it's not, it's all, it's not markets aren't always easy to define. But 10 million is not the right number. 100 million generally is not the right number. You're going to want to compete in a market where, if you have reasonable success, it is possible to hit 100 million dollars, and you're never going to own the whole market. So, you're going to want to compete in markets clearly north of 500 million dollars, and ideally north of a billion dollars. Yeah, it's a lot of that depends on. I mean, you, you can start with a market that's smaller than half a billion, but there's got to be some, some growth velocity. I mean, for right. example, going back to, right. the, to the cell phone game, that was a market Growing. that didn't really exist, but the, the opportunity for that market to take place existed because there were three billion cell phone handsets out there. Um, so you, you, have, you have to look at, at those yeah. types of things. And I think, exactly. I think this is the area where first-time entrepreneurs fall down the most. They, they come up with great creative ideas in their garage or their apartment or their lab, but they don't really think about size. And it's, it's fine to build something if you want to build a small business, 
but we're talking about if you're building something that venture capital is going to be interested in, there, there's got to be significant growth prospects. Because uh, as Rusty said, you can't assume that if it's a $200 million market, you're going to get 90% market share. That just, that's unrealistic. I mean, if you get 5 or 10% of a market, you're doing, you're doing very well. Um, and then I'll kind of go a little quicker on the rest of these. Uh, from a margin perspective, margin is uh, your profit divided by your revenue. Um, we, you would want to compete in a market that has not been commoditized. Um, commodity markets generally have very low value add. They sit at the bottom of the value chain and resultingly, because of the level of competition, have very low margins because it's a price game on the top line. Everybody's got the same cost structure and it ends up being a very low margin business. Um, defensibility uh, is simply ha having high barriers to entry. Um, to the extent you, uh, your, your company has a product that any company out there could replicate in six months with $750,000 that does not represent a barrier to entry. Um, barriers to entry would be high cost, high time, or great intellectual property. Um, a business plan, we've kind of, everything we've described is, is, is the content of what would go into a very well thought out business plan. Um, it's something that clearly needs to be written, and not even specifically to go look for capital. It needs to be written because it forces the entrepreneur to crystallize his own ideas on the way he wants to run his business and the way he wants to sell his product and ultimately um, the path that his company will follow. Um, lastly, management team. Um, oftentimes venture investors say it's the management team that's going to make it because with the right group of people, anything is insurmountable. And, and that's not necessarily, especially speaking to young entrepreneurs, that, that's not necessarily a management team that has 15 plus years in, in running high tech early stage businesses. It's, it's, it's the chemistry between the investment group and the entrepreneur. And the most important thing there is that entrepreneurs know what they don't know. Um, knowing what you don't know is oftentimes significantly more valuable than knowing what you know. Um, and looking, f knowing when to ask for help um, can compensate for the experience of you know, having a 20-year veteran at the helm of an entrepreneurial company. Uh, yeah, let, let me just talk about this. I mean, we, we, because of our audience, uh, uh, we, we put this towards the bottom of the criteria. I, I can tell you that uh, most venture capitalists would put that bullet point number one. Two and, and three. <laughs> and four. Um, if, if you have a management team or, or even a, just a CEO or, some, or, or somebody at, at the senior level who has had at least one successful exit for a venture capitalist and they're going to somewhat stick to an area, an industry that they, they know something about, uh, I guarantee I can raise them 10, 20, 30 million dollars in, in a month. Um, now, if you have a high-tech executive or somebody like Rusty who's been in internet, you know, the internet ad world, and he says, hey, I want to go build a chain of hotels um, in Kazakhstan, they're not, he's not going to raise money doing that. I don't, at least I don't think, unless it's from friends and, uh, and family. Um, but that being said, everybody has their first time, right? So uh, one of the ways you get experience is by building the business. And it kind of goes back to what we talked about with the bootstrapping and the friends and family money and the angels. If you can build a business uh, such as the, the FastClick founders did to a certain critical mass, even if you had no experience, you were just an engineer and you came up with this idea and you built this business and started generating real revenue and making money, uh, that's enough to sort of satisfy the, the management experience criteria. Uh, the other way to, to address this, this problem is to surround yourself uh, with people that, that have uh, relevant experience. Not that you can go out and hire a CEO day one and pay him a half a million bucks, uh, but you can get uh, an advisory board together, consultants, uh, talk to people, have people commit to your business if certain milestones are met. So it, it's, it's, um, 
you know, it, it's not a, uh, it, it's a difficult challenge, uh, you know, pulling together a team that works, uh, but, but it is critical and it, and it can be done with, uh, with some hard work. Last, lastly, um, beginning with the end in mind, venture investors are, are running a business in their own right, and, and they are not, while they are long-term investors, they are not forever investors. Um, be cognizant of the fact that you need to be talking about how you're going to get out and how they're going to get out because they are going to be looking at some point in the future for a way out of the business and that should be first and foremost in everybody's mind it's it's not a secret okay so now you somewhat have it figured out what you need to put together to to raise some capital um, how do you how do you find these capital sources and you know, you're somewhat doing it tonight. I mean, diligent effort and, and uh, you know, getting out instead of, uh, instead of having a beer, coming to, uh, to something like this. You found one venture capitalist right here, so you can all come after him. There are two commercial bankers in the back, a uh, couple of rows. You can, you can chase, chase them down. Um, I've occasionally been an angel investor, but uh, I'm a pretty harsh critic, so uh, uh, be careful. Um, you know, talk to... Uh, Talk to professional advisors, lawyers, accountants. We all know, uh, we all know bankers. We know venture capitalists. We know angels. Um, there's lots of resources on the internet. There are databases, um, and um, there are events. TMP is a great forum for meeting uh, capital sources. I mentioned the Tech Coast Angel. Uh, I would bet you uh, almost any day in California, there is some kind of venture capital or industry conference where these people are showing up and gathering. Um, I know next week I'll be at one in Santa Monica where there's probably going to be 150 VCs and you guys should actually go to that, um, and, and about 150 presenting companies. Some, a lot of these things are invitation only, uh, but you can sneak in, you can, you can, uh, um, you, you can you can find you know hang outside the door. I mean, and and I got to tell you, I mean, VCs and and other people, you know, like somebody that's resourceful and and that uh, is tenacity. persistent. So tenacity is 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 an incredibly uh, incredibly important uh, thing for an entrepreneur to have. And and talk to other entrepreneurs. You've had um, lots and lots of uh, people on this campus and alumni that. Uh, that, uh, that, that Bill Grant back there can, uh, can probably connect you with. That, uh, there's been a lot of successful, successful companies that have uh, got roots here at UCSB and, and seek those people out. Is this mine? It's mine. Okay, good. Should be yours. So, um, increasing your odds of success with a venture capitalist, it's, it's really about having your ducks in a row. Um, Introductions are key. Um, tenacity is worth a lot, but a warm intro goes significantly farther than a cold email. Um, yeah, I think it's similar to, um, I probably get a resume a day in my office from somebody who wants to come work with us as a lawyer. And unfortunately, I, 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 don't, I usually don't look at those. But if somebody I know calls me and says, I know such and such that's graduating from UCLA Law School, um, you know, would you take a look at their resume? I'm much more likely to look at it and, and take it seriously. And venture capitalists are the same way because I'm not going to send something to Rusty uh, if I haven't vetted it, and I obviously don't have uh, his experience as a as a uh, as a venture capitalist, his five months experience as a venture capitalist. Um, you know, vetting plans, but but seriously, you, you're not going to send something. Uh, to somebody and, and impair a relationship unless you think it's 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 reasonable and has a has a shot to be uh, to to be something. So, um, getting somebody to get you across the transom is uh, an important thing. Um, secondly, it's know your audience, know who you're talking to, know what their investment profile is, um, know what they're looking for. They all have websites and they make very clear on their website what style of investing they do. Is it early stage? Is it late stage? Are they regionally focused? Are they nationally focused? Um, are, as a product of stage, what size investment do they, 
most specifically do. And you know, the range is there. Guys are going to be players in the in the five hundred thousands and to two million range. You're going to have guys in the two million to five million, and guys in the ten plus million range. And it, and, and those criteria change from time to time too. So you need to. Right. stay up to date on it. I mean, just to give you an example, most venture capital investors still don't like doing biotech. There are, that's growing, but they, I would say the vast majority of California-based venture capitalists stay out of that space. Um, right. I mean, there's, there's few that do it, and those that do it, do it well, because they have the experience. Everyone else stays away. So if you're sending a biotech business plan to a fund that looks at Internet, software, and mobile, and and, uh, and, and other things like that, um, you're, you're wasting your time. Yeah. Um, next, it's preparation. As I said earlier, it, it's about getting your ducks in a row. And uh, you know, Microsoft Office did a great job with this. Executive summary: um, Think Microsoft Word. Think two at Ooh. most three pages. Business plan: Think 30 to 50 pages. Think Microsoft Word. Um, financial model and projections, think Excel, and uh, an in-person presentation material, think PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to go back to financial modeling and projections because I believe that adds uh, as much or more value as, as the rest of it. Um, my background is in financial analysis and I've built countless models. Uh, a model is uh, it's going to be paramount to your success. Uh, everything comes through the numbers. Every business decision you make is going to have a, an economic, there's going to be an, an economic impact to your income statement from every decision you make. Those decisions should be evident in your income statement, which is your financial model. Oftentimes people are not, uh, uh, entrepreneurs really aren't very, very good at Excel and don't necessarily think through their financial models, it, it pays for itself in spades to the extent you can walk into an initial meeting and explain why your revenue is going up at the rate that it's going up, why your costs are going up or down at the rate they're going up or down, and implicitly what you know, the operational leverage is on the model. Operational leverage is, is your costs not going up as fast as your expenses. And also thinking about how those numbers play out to the reality of the market that you're, that you're seeking. I mean, often you'll just see people sort of double or quadruple revenue every year, and you just get that hockey stick look. And then you say, well, this would mean, you know, for example, that every you know, man, woman, and child in the United States would have to have 10 of these for your revenue numbers to prove out. And that's just not, not realistic. Right. Credibility in your model is, um, is paramount. And to the extent you come in with a model that's not credible, it, it's a turnoff nearly immediately. Because it, it's, this is stuff that should have been thought through. And your penetration into the market that you're competing in, you know, let's say it's 5% in a $500 million market, um, you, you shouldn't have $100 million in revenue if your 5% penetration is going to be at $25 million. Yeah. I just want to go back quickly to the executive summary, because often when I uh, talk to uh, investors that, that I have relationships with, and I say I've you know, got somebody who's got X, Y, Z uh, business idea, what they want to see is the executive summary. Uh, and, and often that executive summary should contain some very high level uh, financial projections. Uh, but it, it really is like Hollywood. I mean, you, you have like a 30 second pitch and if you can get your idea crystallized on a page uh, and with some very high level numbers, uh, that's what will get somebody to then start poking through the business plan and talking to you and tearing through your model. But if you, that, that, that initial uh, reaction to your, to your idea, to your thinking, uh, to your financial, your high level financial model is, is critical. And that, that's probably all you get is, is, is maybe five or ten minutes before somebody says, I'm not even going to waste my time. They don't, they, they're not going to waste their time reading a, a 50 or 60 page business plan if, 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 the, if the executive summary doesn't, uh, doesn't shine through. Right. And as counterintuitive as it seems, if you haven't written the 50 page business plan, you don't know enough to write your three page executive right. summary. 
Um, it, well, you have to have it written because, because they may call you <laughs> like five minutes after they get the, the summary if it's a really hot idea <laughs> and say, we want you here tomorrow right. and you better have the, 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 the meat to, uh, to back it up. Lastly, it's um, being realistic about valuation and it's actually not being realistic about valuation. It's about not setting expectations. Ultimately, your valuation is going to be determined by the market, not you. And going to market with a preconceived notion of what your valuation is and marketing yourself as a $2 million company or a $1 million company or a $7 million company um, simply isn't effective because ultimately your value is going to be determined by the market. More on valuation. Um, I will talk about um, two types of investing, late stage and early stage. In early stage investing, you are, uh, you're talking about companies that are competing between you know, the, the nascent level and the adolescent level. Late stage, I'm thinking companies that are profitable, probably have somewhere north of 10 million in revenue. and. Um, have absolutely different valuations materials associated with them. Let's talk about late stage first. It's, it's the easiest. Um, I would imagine that you guys all know what a P.E. ratio is. A price to earnings is the multiple of future earnings that you're willing to pay currently for a stock. And the same applies to an entire company. Um, you know, to the extent the company is going to do uh, a, a million dollars in earnings and you're willing to pay 10 times earnings, then you're implicitly going to put a $10 million valuation on a company like that. Um, metrics are, are, are everywhere with public comparables um, for valuing late stage businesses because they have revenue that you can put multiples of revenue against from the public sector. They have earnings, which you can put multiples of earnings from the public sector against. Um, it becomes much more of an art when you start talking about early stage companies. With early stage companies, it's um, you know it's it, it's it's idea, it's market validation, it's alpha, and then beta, and then you're in the say you're in the market and generating revenue, and it's milestones like this that are going to trigger deltas in your valuation, um, and, and it's literally in that order. Uh, for example, a company that's going to market but isn't yet in the market is going to have a significantly higher valuation than a guy with a couple of drawings on a paper of a machine or a robot that thinks he can change the world with it. That's different because there's so much risk between a pretty drawing and a functioning, economically viable machine that's going to be produced and sold in the market. Um, some quick definitions that you may run into. Pre-money valuation, um, think of that as the value of your company prior to raising capital. Post-money valuation is your pre-money valuation plus any of the money you raised. Um, so for example, early stage business with a $3 million valuation. Um, as an entrepreneur, you can go out and raise a million dollars and have a $4 million pre-money valuation and the new guy came in for a million bucks. On a $4 million post money, he ends 25% of the business. Assuming you owned everything from the get-go, you would own um, um, you know, the other 75% of the business. Uh, to the extent you had a pre-money of $3 million and you raised $3 million, um, it's $6 million, it's three of the six is yours, three of the six is theirs. You've significantly diluted yourself. The story here is don't raise more capital than you need because that capital is going to come cheaper as you grow later in stage. And lastly, fully diluted valuation um, includes the value of any stock options or warrants that you have that can create further shares of stock. So uh, we'll talk quickly, because uh, I know we're, we're getting short on time, about uh, what, what the deal looks like and, and uh, how it gets done. The most common form a venture capital investment is what's called convertible preferred stock. And since most of these companies have little or no debt, uh, the preferred stock uh, puts the venture capitalists at the top of the food chain in terms of uh, getting their money out first before, uh, b before the other investors. Um, you're going to go out, talk to venture capitalists, pitch them, give them your business plan, 
and hopefully you'll be fortunate enough to get a term sheet from somebody which will set out the, the, the basic uh, pricing of a deal and, and the terms, all the bells and whistles, uh, which, which we need another two or three hours to, uh, to go through. Um, one of the things that they're always going to ask you to do is enter into a no-shop. And at the point that you're happy with the deal that you've struck with this particular investor, um, they're going to want you to essentially get married to them and go exclusive and not talk to any other uh, investors for a period of time until the deal gets done. Uh, they're going to do what's called due diligence, which is look at everything that uh, is anything to have to do with your business. With early stage companies, it tends to be a little easier process uh, because they're not quite as complex and mature as a, as a, as a more uh, mature operating company. But they're going to want to look at yeah, all your sure. employee issues, all your very focused on intellectual property issues, uh, very focused on, uh, on, uh, on your corporate formation documents. Uh, we'll just quickly run through some, some of the key issues that come up. Uh, liquidation preference is what I uh, reference in terms of if the company gets liquidated, whether that's in a bankruptcy or, or some other forced liquidation or a sale or an uh, initial public offering, how does the money flow, who gets what, and uh, trust me, the, the preferred stockholders usually get taken care of, uh, get taken care of first. Uh, Anti-dilution protection, or what is, what is an easier way to understand it, is price protection. There's usually some price protection for the venture investor so that if money is raised later uh, at uh, a price less than what the venture capitalist paid, uh, they're going to get some protection at the expense of the, the founders and the common stockholders. Meaning they don't, they continue to own the same amount of the company from a, on a percentage basis. Right. Uh, registration rights uh, has to do with uh, registering their stock at some point uh, for a public offering. Uh, again, a pretty complex area. We won't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, your investors are almost always going to demand board representation. Depending on the size of the investment, they may get control of your board. Uh, there are a number of other rights that, that uh, you see up here. Co-sale rights, rights of first refusal, and drag-along rights, which affect um, th their ability uh, to get a piece of future offerings by the company, uh, their ability, if somebody wants to sell stock, to sell alongside of them, that's a co-sale right, or to force the founders to sell with them uh, under certain circumstances. And they're also going to get a lot of veto rights over incurrence of debt, over other equity issuances, over entering into major, major uh, contracts. So, um, and, and all with good reason. I mean, you know, if somebody is writing a two, three, four, five, ten million dollar check is looking to, you know, not only uh, protect their potential return, but protect their 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 pr the principal in their investment. Uh, lastly, you get to people like me. Um, fortunately, in a in a venture deal, unlike uh, some of the deals that I that I put on my bio, uh, which can take months and months and cost, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in legal fees. Putting these deals together, there's a pretty accepted form. There's some variation, but uh, the legal documents, at least for the lawyers that do these deals, are fairly simple, um, and, and you know the expense is, is not uh, too significant for most venture deals. Uh, usually in the you know twenty to forty thousand dollars for for both investor and, and company counsel. Uh, you get all that stuff negotiated. You close, sign the documents. Uh, you get a little wrist cramp from from signing so much paper. Uh, hopefully the money shows up and uh, you have a little celebration and then you know the hard work begins because as hard as it is raising the money actually putting it to work and creating additional equity value uh, is probably even even harder so as we said it's uh, it's a difficult thing to do but um, don't give up if you if you hope to succeed the only way that I know to build a company is with some cash uh, but uh, I think that that brings us to uh, to the end And uh, Rusty Reed, we'll now go to uh, Q and A. So, if you would wait for a microphone, please, for your question, we can get it recorded. I have a question about the difference in the anatomy between an angel and venture capitalist. Um, it was clear to me that an angel is an is a is a freewheeling individual. Whereas typically, whereas a venture capitalist um, is associated with a larger firm and is connected to other sources of capital, um, is that always the case? 
Yeah, I, I think the, the one of the key, there's a couple of key differences. The, uh, the, the venture capitalist is really a professional investor and, and they have uh, fiduciary obligations to their limited partners. Uh, so, so most venture money is, uh, for example, there's a ton of venture money from the UC system that is you know, being deployed by professional venture capitalists around the state. Big pension funds, endowment funds, uh, very high net worth uh, individuals who put their money with these folks uh, because they have a background, whether as an entrepreneur, um, investment banker, uh, a lot of ex-lawyers who become venture capitalists. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they trust that they will safeguard that money. And so, yeah, they, they have to be, uh, they're not only in it for a return, but they have a, an obligation to their LPs. Whereas the angel, it, it's, it's their money. And as, as we talked about, they may have other motives. They, they may tend to be a little more altruistic, maybe looking for, for something to do that, that is intellectually stimulating. Um, and and I, th I think it's really about where you are. If you're, if you're at a certain level, uh, you, venture capital may not be an option. Uh, I think for a, a more mature company that can raise venture capital, I, I think you're, you're, you would be crazy in that situation to go to an angel if you had the ability to get the validation and, and usually a lot more capital that, that, than you, that you can get from a, from a VC than, than an angel.